Hello, everyone, and welcome again to our Maestro's Musings. I'm Geraldine Parent, Executive Director of the Okanagan Symphony, and it's certainly a pleasure to welcome you here. I hope uh, your afternoon, wherever you are, is as pleasant as we're experiencing uh, here in uh, Kelowna. And Dina will probably talk a little bit about the snow they're experiencing in, um, in Montreal today. Um, We've got more people coming into our room right now, but I just want to welcome you again. This is our third of four conversations we've had between our own music director, Rosemary Thompson, and our various guests across the country. We've, you know, advertised this as a 30-minute conversation with a Q&A, and if you've been involved in the last two, you know, we've gone slightly over, a little bit under. It all depends on the Q&A and your responses. So if you do need to leave um, early, we are recording the session. And it will be uploaded to our website uh, within a couple of days so you'll be able to see anything that you mm -hmm. might have you might have missed. So um, as you know, we're all becoming familiar with Zoom and we still often forget. So just a couple of housekeeping things while we're getting underway. Uh, we'll ask you to keep your microphones on mute throughout the conversation. You're welcome to keep your videos on or off. Uh, I think we've all experienced some time if there's a lot of people on the call that if you turn your video off, sometimes your internet is a little bit better. So if you encounter that, that might be a suggestion for you. Please use the chat function. I'm just going to say hello to everyone um, so you know where that is. You know, if you have any questions or comments, they can be put in the chat room. And if you are, you know, just a reminder about your Zoom screen, typically in the top right hand corner of your Zoom screen, you have the option to change your screen view. Um, sometimes it's under more, uh, depending on your system. So likely you're going to want to turn to speaker view when we actually get started and you'll be able to just look at Rosemary and Dina um, and the rest of us will kind of disappear into the background. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Rosemary, uh, who will introduce our guest Dina for today. Thank you. Thanks, Geraldine. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to see you all again. And uh, I'm just so thrilled today to have as my guest, Dina Gilbert. Uh, Dina is really one of Canada's rising stars on the podium and uh, is, is enjoying a career across this country, but also increasingly in Asia, in Europe, and in the United States. And we're so thrilled to have Dina with us today. Um, Dina was the assistant conductor to Kent Nagano at the uh, Orchestre Symphonique de Montréal at the Montreal Symphony. And she also is currently a couple of different positions. She's the music director of the um, Orchestre Symphonique de l'Histoire in Quebec and also at the Kamloops Symphony. And I didn't realize, and I was just uh, finding out this recently, that she founded a group called the Chamber Orchestra Ensemble Arkea which is really devoted to Canadian composers. So I definitely want to ask you about that, but I'd love to uh, just first welcome Dina. Thank you for coming and start by asking you, what do you love about conducting and what was the spark or what was the path that you took to, to pursue this as a career? Oh my God, thank, first of all, thank you so much for having me in this uh, wonderful uh, chat, Rosemary, it's, it's a pleasure. Uh, this is a big question, so yeah, how long can I go on this one? <laughs> um, at first, I would say that what I like with conducting is that I started, um, I started as a pianist, then moved on to clarinet playing, and I really enjoyed clarinet because then I was able to play with music in an ensemble. And I felt that this connection with other people was super enriching. And while I was doing then some cadets, uh, marching band and so on, you know, as a clarinet player, and watching the person who was conducting and so on, I had already a clear idea about how I would have made things sometimes and so on. And actually, um, as a teen, uh, already some adults were in charge of my little church choir or the marching bands and the cadets and so on. Some my curiosity for conducting, and they've been actually letting me conduct. My colleagues were about the same age as me uh, from a really early age. Uh, so then at first I really, I, I self-taught conducting and I lo loved it. And what I like about this was the, the fact that there's no more filter between you and the music. Uh, then it's about connecting with human beings and making music together. And this is probably, probably why I love conducting so much. It's because it's a link of everything about music and also everything about human connection. And this is why when I finally realized I was to become a conductor, it made, 
it was clear that, oh my God, this is what I was looking for, but had no idea this could exist as a profession before a long time. So in short, I would say this is why I'm really lucky and blessed to be a conductor now. <laughs> it is, I feel the same way how, you know, connecting with music, but connecting with human beings who are making the music. I mean, when you consider that really on stage, the conductor is the only one who's not actually making sound. <laughs> it is a very bizarre profession in that regard, but I, I, uh, I love that you said no filter between the music because it really is very immediate with the people that are making the music with you. And so you did, um, you completed your doctorate at the University of Montreal. I should be calling you Dr. Gilbert. <laughs> and uh, tell me a little bit about what it was like to assist uh, with Kent Nagano. What was your journey going from your studies into that opportunity? And, and was it an audition process? How did you, how did you, um, how did you find, how did you get that opportunity? I mean, it's been such a big journey for this because as you mentioned, okay, yeah, Dr. Gilbert, I'm, I'm, I'm really rarely <laughs> using the doctor in anything in this because for me, diplomas are one thing, but for us musicians, we are in training all our life. Mm -hmm. So we never finish something. We never have enough knowledge. What I just understood with the doctorate in hand was my God, all things I don't know yet. <laughs> so for me, it's always about this more than anything. So when I finally been assistant conductor at Orchestre Symphonique de Montréal. Um, it was incredible experience because every day I was in the concert hall hearing the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, one of the top uh, level orchestra, definitely in the international scene and also in Canada for sure. Um, doing two programs, two different programs per week, being there with the music, with the scores that I'm lending from the from the library, with all notations sometimes from wonderful country wow. and at the OSM and then looking at all this, looking at the Boeings. Um, it's been such a fulfilling experience. And I took really every second of these incredible three years that were super busy in which I was following Maestro Nagano who has, so for, because some people say, say uh, Dina, you have a lot of energy, but you have no idea about Maestro Nagano then because he's, he, he's never tired. Meaning that like I could start a day uh, knowing at what time I would start, but for the end of my day could sometimes be at 1 a.m. because after a concert, we'd be going in post-production to listen to the next to, to the next concert to be launched and then listening to the next edit and so on. So those uh, weeks in which he was in town were super, super exciting. And pretty much as an assistant, I was following him in everything. Meaning that thanks to him, I understood also the value and the responsibilities of a music director to its orchestra, to its community. Because yes, as conductor, yes, we're having fun or studying music, being in contact in concert and so on. But there's so much more <laughs> than that when we are a music director, as you know. Um, and that I could really learn with my student again. I felt that he was really a key, um, the kind of model of what we're looking for in a 21st century uh, conductor. Uh, and the, the, our responsibility, our role has been changing a lot, evolving over the years. Um, meaning that we need to have all these kind of different skills uh, and interests, making sure that the uh, orchestra will be sustainable, that there will be different activities for the community and so on. But I think now I just put a big parenthesis and lost track of your initial question. No, 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 it's, it's all wonderful. It, I mean, I, I love when you're talking about, there really is, um, it's a blend for sure. It's not a hard line, but the, the skills required to be a conductor are all musical and also psychological because as we've said, your, your musician are a group of people, but the skills required to be a music director are, are quite different. Again, some overlap, but um, I do find that having that residency opportunity to assist someone who's really experienced at it is a kind of school in and of itself. And so I, I'm glad you raised that. How have you found because the other thing you I want to touch on is when you talked about the 21st century orchestra. Mm -hmm. So we're in this time period where, where socially things are changing so rapidly and we are all examining our sector as a colonial historical um, ensemble. How do you see or where do you see the most important shifts that need to be made in the world of orchestra in order to remain sustainable and relevant to our changing communities? That's a big question. I know you're already doing some really innovative things. So I'm just curious, 
how you approach that aspect? I mean, it's a big question and I'm thinking a lot about it, but I haven't had enough um, um, perspective from far away yet because I feel these questions are taking a lot of consideration and, and time to mm -hmm. digest. Though what I'm convinced is that with the pandemic, every, every sector and music including, for me, we are pushed to have to make a leap of 10 years forward mm -hmm. in meanings of the way we are marketing things, the way we are producing our content, the way we are uh, in everything. It's been changing, but it's not only us. It's uh, teachers has been changing the way they needed to be super quick at uh, technologies now. And it looks like now I would say that one of the things I'm pretty sure is that interdisciplinary will be one of the key trend to sustain and, and keep music relevant and arts relevant over the years, uh, I would say. And I have strong interest regarding these topics as well. So I'm looking and, and searching, but usually my, my time for such big topics are really like over the summer when it's a calmer season and I'm off podium. And then I can revisit what was the last uh, year of connection uh, and experiences with both my orchestras, but also as a guest conductor. And I can then define what would be next. And this year, as an example, we saw how it was so different in terms of uh, from the idea to presenting the concert, everything was condensed. And actually, to me, it felt way more exciting. I really like that, actually. Because I feel that sometimes I struggle, this is personal, but I struggle about planning something in 18 months for a program of music that, oh my God, this is so exciting. I want to do this right now. Months, we are already somewhere else. So do we really need this at that moment? So this is one of the things I felt that like this year, particularly, of course, we had a lot of challenges to overcome and things to that to, we needed to adjust. But one of the things I, I really appreciated though was the fact that between I could, feel the, ten of the, the sense of what are we doing now? How are we feeling right now? And what would we, what would we, we, we would like to maybe listen or what would be our appetite for such things or to try things? And that I, I, I hope will be able to try a little bit more, uh, let's say over the years, maybe so, not for ten, So not like, quite as long a planning period, so things that we can be doing right away. I, do you find that challenging because the pressure then is sort of constant all the time. Do, I, I, I struggle right now. I, I totally hear what you're saying about having that summer to kind of decompress and be able to have the reflective time and both the planning time. I think one of the things that this year has been a struggle for me, and I wonder if it's the same for you, is that because there's so many different plans that you've had to try to put in place that, that I feel like there's, there's so little time to really devote to, to that planning piece does that does that resonate for you do you know yeah that resonates about the long term i think the mission vision values of our of our organization for sure are clear but to me the action of how we are putting things together was more okay we are trying something and then being a little bit less i guess um and it's been experienced for for, for me in this uh, being less um um concern about trying something that might be not perfect at the first time because of course yeah. we're all trying things for the first time this year i know so, our, first, um, our first live stream i came out and tried to shake my concert master's hand right and thank thank god she went no nope. all oh, right covid not supposed to shake hands like just little things like that so yeah. can you tell me a little bit tell us a little bit about your experiences i know that you've been doing this uh, hip hop show that you did in france and you, and i see you doing it in montreal and also in kamloops you you have this show that is the sounds of sand with sand artists so that's kind of the interdisciplinary work that you're talking about how has it been to both plan those kinds of experiences and and how have they have they were there any surprises did it come off the way you expected it to how did it connect to the community? Just, just talk a little bit about what that was like to be part of those experiences. Yeah, there's all, I mean, these are really two different projects. Um, I did, when I did my doctorate, my thesis as a performer was on how to synchronize, so how to synchronize music and image, images. So all the methodology oh. and techniques about it. So yes, I did my, my concert with Brahms, uh, uh, Rachmaninoff and so on. But regarding my thesis paper, it was linked to this, meaning that it's been a, a long time that I'm having interest with this because I realized I had a, a three-year opportunity in which 
we were doing project with Cinémathèque Québécoise, was doing like black and uh, black and white old movies and so on. And there was a pianist repetitor there improvising, really like in the old days uh -huh. of cinema muet, uh, doing this. And since there was a collaboration with Université de Montréal at that at that moment, I changed my topic because I felt, oh, I'm going to do it on this because opportunity. There was an opportunity to yeah. blend theory with practice, and this is something I really find uh, that was fulfilling me more as a performer than just doing something in written. Meaning that from that start, I realized that such projects are something special because it's the, the same thing as Rosemary, as if you would be collaborating with a really stubborn soloist that doesn't have, that won't do any compromises, right? <laughs> so uh, doing this was quite um, uh, interesting regarding techniques because you need to adjust with something yeah. that won't be adjustable. Meaning that for all the other kind of projects, let's say hip hop or sound or film we did in the, in the past, there's always that efficiency and synchronicity that is super important. In the case of hip hop concert, that was easy in this side in this way because we had a click and we needed to have a click because those hip hop uh, artists in France, they put their flow. And if it's like uh, 86 instead of 84, they might not have the time to, to say everything in the perfect rhythm and so on. So in this case, this aspect was easy, though uh, what was super interesting when I've been uh, working with that project with hip hop artists in France was um, that the language we use as performers is different. So I had, for example, some gospels and jazz musicians from a small band, and some of those singers were incredible. I even like said to one of the, of the girl, hey, you had no clue, but you have perfect pitch. And I learned, <laughs> I told her that she had perfect pitch. She didn't know because she was like not reading music and so on, but always right and, and incredible. So I needed to process the information in between the orchestra, bar, ta, 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 and then the band, chorus, da, 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 and then singer yeah, singing the notes, and then the, heart, the, the, the hip hop artist about which verse are we doing. So it was all that kind of different kind of organization planning as a conductor that was required. Um, and not necessarily about, oh my God, musically, it will be difficult. It was more about how am I able to make these different walls connect yeah. to each other so they have respect for the high artistry they all have, but we are not speaking the same language. So that was pretty much how it was at first. And I could see the, the musician from the Orchestre Philharmonique de Radio France not wanting to have the click in their ear because they don't like it, you know? So it was all that kind of, uh, at first, um, animosity or like, not sure I'm gonna like this. No, don't, I don't want to do this and so on. Oh, how much time are we taking now just for sound tests for the singer? But at the end, I mean, when, we, when I'm seeing uh, the, the concert, because they are still on YouTube, everybody was like enjoying, uh, enjoying themselves a lot. And it was also because the audience who came for that concert, they, they needed to uh, register a few days. Um, they needed to register, have their free tickets or free pass to come. And I, I think the website crashed or something because the, the demand was so high and the audience was there. I received a lot of emails after these concerts, whenever it's launched on TV or after those performances, people said, wow, it's the first time I feel that my radio station is speaking to me in kind, in kind of content. And that was super powerful because hip hop music in France is the most listened mu kind of music but it's not the most listened music you can hear at the radio. Right. Meaning that then it was reaching a lot of audiences that what an orchestra, what? I mean, I'm supposed to go in that really nice venue. I've never had an occasion to go with. And people were there with their phone and, you know, filming and having, enjoying their, enjoying their this special moment. So I would say that this kind of risky collaboration sometimes there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of people to convince at administrative side and everything, but this, I have no, um, no credit in this. It was all thanks to the person who invited me in this project, who was uh, Ivan, uh, Isan Krimi, who was the co-arranger, who was the pianist at the project, who has been the super nice leader in this, putting all different people right. together and convincing Orchestre Philharmonique de Radio France. So then they are already in their fourth edition. So I was the lucky one doing the two first edition. We did it at one point with Orchestre National de Lyon for a festival de jazz à Vienne in the big uh, uh, amphitheater uh, outdoor. So that was exciting. Regarding then Sound and, uh, sound and Sand in, um, uh, in Kamloops, then it was more about the fact we had tried, uh, we had uh, already produced a 
a film, a Phantom of the Opera, or uh, back in October, with that process on which we were recording the music and I had this small screen in front of me synchronizing everything and then putting that together so we could see it. So then um, after a discussion with the team, we, we tested the idea of having that send artist. I was in contact since a few years and I wanted to collaborate with her and she's in Russia. Uh, she doesn't speak English, but her husband who's also her agent was speaking French and English. So it was super interesting actually with Daniel at one point having a uh, meeting in three different time zones in three different languages. Um, and then they've been, they been jumping on this idea of uh, recreating that sound art uh, on our previously recorded uh, sound audio that we send there. And uh, I also propose the, um, the piece of Iman Abibi if she could then create something totally new on this. But I said to Danielle, like, okay, I'm totally confident in, in what uh, their art is true and everything, but it was still risky about what are we going to see because the timeline is super close. Uh, so it was uh, quite uh, exciting, but we've been super happy with the with uh, the artistry of how, how it came together to see that when we are confident with the path and the experience of everyone and also of people and the person who was also Joy Factor redoing all the other together, we can come to something really interesting. And this is something that I feel always fulfilling whenever we try these things, because we are learning from the bagage, from the perspective of someone else. So, so when, when, we, when we do, <laughs> in order to do something truly creative, which I'm so excited just hearing you describe these projects, and I definitely, I didn't know I could still go watch the hip hop show. So I definitely want to do that. We'll make sure we get a link for everybody so you can. But in order to do something truly creative, you have to step off the shore that you know, right? You have to be in that place of, I don't know how this is going to go. You have to take that risk in order to get something very compelling. So in the world of orchestra, where there's, there's so much that has to come together to be successful and you're involving so many different personalities, everybody with their own training and their own idea of what orchestra is. How do you see us moving the art form of orchestra forward so that we really not, not reject the history of our traditional music, which we love, but, but truly embrace, how do we get all of our, our, our players, our administration, our boards, and some of our traditional audiences to come with us on that journey. How do you see that working over the next 20 years in your career? Mm -hmm. At first, I think we need to be super enthusiastic about any piece we're performing, be it Beethoven or the last piece of Dino Krishoratner that I'm admiring so much. Um, I feel it's, it all starts with this. If we're so passionate about something, people will also trust us in the process mm -hmm of uh, what would be the next thing. I recall that like before being assistant conductor of Orchestre Symphonie de Montréal, I, when I was doing my studies of master's and doctorate, I was working at the box office at the MSO mm -hmm. because then I could have free tickets for all concerts and I could have a lot of conversation with also with our with audience, be it longtime subscribers or people who were asking and not knowing, hey, how should I dress to come to the concert for the first time? And actually, I've always felt that these experiences were super rich for me to become a conductor because I understood a little bit. I was a little bit, I understood a little bit what it looks like for someone who doesn't know about music and what are their um, uh, concerns, like their fears. Concerns, I yeah. guess, about yeah, yeah, no. for me, is this for me, and so on. So discussing all of this, I'm always thinking about when planning a, 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 a programming or something. I'm always thinking about these different kinds of people, the person who's a long time subscriber, the person who doesn't know the, con the composer's name there, but I'm sure that from the first listening of this piece, they will like it. So I'm, I'm trying a lot of, I'm, I'm, I'm really love to be able to expose the audience in Kamloops to a lot of Canadian composers and different music from our time as well, be it not also of a Canadian composer, but music from our time. Because sometimes I feel that this is the music in which I feel the more connected, Mm -hmm. um, and right away, intuitively, intensively. I'm not saying that I like every kind of contemporary music, no. But like, I feel that when I'm touched, when I feel there's a message and there's something like you cannot express in words, but you know, uh, you, you kind of connect immediately with the imaginary of that composer. I really like to test these, um, these works with 
maybe more recognized or well-known composers in which I like the, to take the bargain of like, uh, let's try people will come because they know they are familiar with this composer's name, but I want them to be super excited. And when they leave, they will be excited about that other piece they've been listening for the first time. So that would be a little bit my, that's a little bit the way I'm, I'm, I'm trying to plan things. Um, so for me, I mean, I, doesn't, I don't see it too much as a struggle because for me, I don't want to put on the side any kind of, of the masterworks we love so much. Yeah. It's more about how can we reflect and see them differently when we just tapple them with something different. So I like the thematic concert. I like these kind of different things that will put lights and for me will make more meaning. I will have more meaning in between the works put together in a concert. Well, and sometimes hearing Beethoven in the context of a Canadian contemporary composer, you hear Beethoven differently, right? Exactly. Um, the great percussionist Evelyn Glennie always says, if you want young people to come to the orchestra, play contemporary music. And I think it's exactly for that reason. And whenever I've done uh, concerts where I have a young, young people in the audience, if they've come to an open dress rehearsal, and I always make a point of speaking with them, Usually the contemporary piece is the favorite piece on the program because they don't know the, necessarily the context of Beethoven, but it is that um, that piece speaks to them of their current world. And I know that, um, you know, when you had great relationships like Kusevitsky, he would, he would commission Copeland and Zanakis, he would commission these composers and then he would play the piece every season for 10 years and it then had become part of the standard repertoire. So do you find that you're getting uh, buy-in from your traditional patrons and that they're enjoying discovering these new Canadian voices? How is that, how is that translated with your audience? I would, need, I would need to ask Danielle and everything <laughs> for survey again. Like, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, so far we've re been receiving great comments uh, regarding these discoveries and so on. So. I don't feel yet, I haven't, I'm not really concerned, I would say, with this, because I feel we've been guiding the process also gradually uh, regarding this. I guess also that this year, particularly since um, there was maybe less risk, let's say, ticketing wise and so on, maybe I took even more risk sometimes mm -hmm. about this, but I was so much in love with those pieces and they were featuring sometimes some of our own principal soloists that I felt these were uh, great to be uh, heard and so on. So, and I felt also that the, in this pandemic year, uh, performers should be as much receiving works, but also composers and any kind of artists, people who are on stage helping us. Um, I feel that like doing this production with less musician, of course, it's been such a difficult to know that like we cannot hire the amount of musicians we used to and so on, that I felt that it was also our responsibility as, as um, leaders of organization to try as much as possible to uh, showcase these uh, wonderful works from composers and to make them shine in a year in which it might be super difficult. And yeah, it might, it, it is super difficult. Um, but yeah, I would say that like, I'm just enthusiastic and I hope our patrons will still be enthusiastic <laughs> regarding this. And I love what you say regarding Kusevitsky planning different times yeah. a piece because I feel that's one of the main issue or challenge we have or we commission a piece or we play it once and then we never play it again and that's one of the things composers are complaining about uh, actually this current season we are doing a new arrangement from a piece we've been commissioning last year that was our concert just before the pandemic hit uh -huh. and so i really recall this concert really really uh, strongly in my mind it was with beethoven heroica and we did actually i'm seeing kathy there yes it was whisper of the mountain she was playing in this piece um, and then we've been asking to do an orchestration that is smaller, obviously, because with COVID, we couldn't have the same amount of musicians. Uh, and it was to make, sh make sure that we have a second experience uh, with Cesqua Forti, wonderful vocalist, uh, and uh, the piece of Katia Matkisi Warren, both of their voices together. So it's not just a one-time experience. Yeah. We had, we, it was good to have the, the process of doing more than one performance, but I feel that after one year and with how special it was to do this, this premiere, um, it's actually the first time I'm, I'm requesting to rearrange something so we do it the next year. So I will see if it's a new trend we do. We do. Um, but I felt there was also a lot of people who, who would have wished to attend that concert. And now with the fact that we are unfortunately or fortunately recording our concert, 
I feel that this piece then would, would have uh, another Bigger opportunity yeah. to be uh, reached out to, uh, to other audiences. So, so Dina, Dina, it occurs to me that we need to have a, a wine date and plan some co-commissions <laughs> for our orchestra. Because sure. I think we're on the same path in how we are uh, hoping to champion our Canadian composers. And I know that your ensemble that you founded, Arkea, the, the Chamber Orchestra, is really devoted to the voices of Canadian composers. So congratulations on that. I know you're getting very busy and hard to manage to keep that going, but um, it's wonderful every time I see, and I, I think that we have, uh, from when I started conducting, we have a lot more Canadian conductors. And I think that we, are, we will see, because we have more Canadian conductors, they'll be championing those Canadian voices as composers. And I'm very, very excited to see what the future brings for them. Can you tell us a little bit about your Conducting 101 course that you do? Ah, is it Conducting just 101. for kids or is it for ever, all ages? Actually, I started it with uh, as an assistant conductor at Orchestre Symphonique de Montréal as part of their classical spree. That is a big festival, summer festival over a few, few days in which they present shorter concerts uh, with a really, really low ticket or free outdoor concert for thousands of people. And they were adding a few activities and they said, hey, Dina, we would like to do a little activity, you know, uh, would you like, please, could you please lead this so it, it, it works out? So in a really short amount of time, I tried to see how I could teach conducting to different kinds of people. And so I had a little orchestra of only seven people. And it's funny because since then, it's been always with seven musicians, but it's just because of that very first time and the size of the stage that were allowing seven musicians, meaning that I finally decided it was to be string quartet plus uh, bassoon, uh, flute, and clarinet. Um, and then I, 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 I did some quick arrangements of like well-known pieces of Mozart, Beethoven, Grieg. People would recognize, but not necessarily knowing what is the composer's name and so on. Uh, and it was like the orchestra was in the hallway from uh, going in between the venue and the, let's say the, the mall. So people were going there and waiting and, and watching that 30 minutes. So I had like little conducting battle, taking few apprentices of all ages. So kids, people from 50 years old, 70, no musician. Was, you don't need to have any musician's background, no problem. So I was, I was teaching them the process. And through this activity, then you, yes, you understand a little bit about what are the really basic, let's say it, because we know uh, basic things about, okay, in five minutes, I can show you how to beat uh, to uh, two B pattern, three B pattern uh, and so on. But there's way more than this, but for the fun and intuitive way of what it is to communicate with musicians, I'm doing this uh, small project. And then the apprentices are trying their skills with the orchestra that is really following um, in good ways or bad ways what they are doing. And actually it was super interesting when we did this with uh, the classical spree because of the range of ages and range of different kind of clientele who was coming in front. And it was funny because then you could see how funny it was and exciting it was to get because people were really not shy. Um, and after that I've been then transforming a little bit the activity, presenting it in Quebec with Orchestre Symphonie de l'Estuaire and in Kamloops, in, in which way then we are also at first for kids in elementary schools, presenting the instrument we have there, showing some excerpts, asking a few questions to musicians about how they chose that instrument. And then I get really the topic of how to conduct an orchestra. And again, small kids of five, seven, 10 years old, uh, little boys, little girls are coming in front, trying their skills. Um, and before COVID, obviously, um, I always been touched because sometimes there are young girls and young boys who are coming to me and like, today I decided I want to become a conductor. So it's such, um, special to, to, to be able to communicate that love of music with, with small children. And since it's only seven musicians, it means that we are doing tours of different gymnasium uh, and that allows at least that really small municipalities or underserved uh, communities get to hear a bassoon for the first time, uh, get to hear a cello for the first time. And it's always fun to see their reaction to such things. Because I recall me as a kid, uh, thanks to my parents, I've been introduced to piano really young, but my parents were not musicians. And in my orchestra, there was no in my orchestra. In my town, there was no orchestra around and nothing like this. So even for me, the, all the symphonic world appeared to me pretty much when I moved to Montreal at 16 years old. So this is why I feel that for me, if I would have heard those sounds at an early age, maybe I would have ask uh, my, my, my parents to, to learn another instrument or so on. Or would I, I've learned that 
way earlier that I wanted to become a conductor, but I had no clue at that point. So it's a lot of fun doing these activities, for sure. I, I love that you're taking it into um, other places and other gymnasiums. We did a series at the Okanagan Symphony in the library where we had the four different families on four different concerts and it was so fun to have percussion in the library right everything you've always learned about the library is to be quiet and and there i can see dominique and katie on the call here and there we are bashing right and what we always did after was we had a, what we called a petting zoo for instruments and the kids and and what was surprised me was how many adults and seniors came and tried the instruments as well so i had it in my head that if we went back to doing this library show when we can get back to some of those normal <laughs> concerts um, I really wanted to do a fifth show and do it all about conducting. So again, we need that glass of wine so I can pick your brain about how all that worked and steal your arrangements. <laughs> but congratulations <laughs> on doing that already. I, I think it's um, conducting is such a, a special thing to do and a special connection. And it seems so mysterious if you're outside of it. So for people to just pick up a, a baton and, and just feel what it's like to have musicians respond to their gesture uh, at the very basic level, I think it can really intrigue you as to the profession but also in it's a different way of inviting people into the world of orchestra and mm -hmm. um, you know it's just so I, I could talk to you for hours your enthusiasm and your passion is infectious and it's got such authenticity about it and i think we're going to see just great things from you in over the course of your career as you have already and I very much look forward to any collaborating that we can do here in BC. And I wanna thank you hugely for being part of this series and for everybody to see what this young generation of Canadian conductors is doing in our country and around the world. We, we are all very proud of you. Ah, <laughs> that doesn't sound too, too condescending. I have to say how, how enthusiastic I was when I arrived in BC knowing that I was not to be the only female conductor around you know and it was also fun to see how quickly we've been connecting to each other yeah uh, and how lucky I felt about uh, about that knowing that you came at one to dress rehearsal we've been in contact after sharing information re regarding I I've requesting you some uh, soloist recommendation and so on so I've been super feeling grateful about uh, that that close connection you've been uh, you've been uh, having with me as, as an outsider coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. All Canadian. Um, I wasn't going to I wasn't going to bring up the female card, but uh, you know, there's in my time of conducting because I'm a lot older than you. It's really exciting for me to see how many more women are getting into this profession. Um, I think women make great conductors. I always have. And uh, so we'll have, we'll have some more conversation about that another time. But I long for the day when we don't say female conductor, we just say conductor. And I, I totally think that agree. day is coming. <laughs> and your, your ability and your, um, your, your excitement, I think really, it does a lot to show, you know, doesn't matter what gender you are, you can be a great conductor and a great leader. And I do think that your passion and your enthusiasm are extraordinary and it inspires me and all those I'm sure that are in both under your baton and listening to your music and connecting with you in any way. So I'm so excited to have had this opportunity to chat with you more and for my patrons to meet you. And it's not a long drive up to Kamloops once we are all able to get back into the live theater and also the Kamloops Symphony performs in Salmon Arms. So it's just another opportunity to be enriched with live orchestral music once we're all vaccinated. Um, yeah. I do want to say that our next <laughs> session is May the 27th. That will be our final Maestro's Music for this season. And my guest will be Timothy Vernon, who is the founder and artistic director of Pacific Opera Victoria and has enjoyed a great career across the country as well. Um, Dina, thank you so much for joining us and I uh, look forward to connecting with you again soon. My pleasure. Thank, thank you to all our listeners for, for uh, coming in and joining us today on our Maestro Musings. We look forward to seeing you at the next one. And I should mention that next week is our final live stream of the season on May the 1st, New Beginnings, which will feature Siegfried Adil by Wagner, Blumina by Mahler, uh, Rain on Tin Roof by Karin Guermont, and also a Chamber Symphony by Nino Rota, the great film composer. So we are very excited for that uh, performance and hope that you'll tune in on Unicorns Live. Dina, thank you. Let's have that glass of wine soon and change the world. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye.